So, 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 so.
I'm not sure if this is better, probably. Good morning, gentle people. I just wanted to say that we are starting in a few minutes. This is the uh, pre-event on uh, AI and discrimination. As you might have noticed, congratulations, first of all, for being here, because you beat the queue. Uh, well done. Uh, I'm getting text messages non-stop that we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. So that means that some of our speakers and uh, co-facilitators for the working groups are still in the queue. So if you give us one more minute, we just are organizing, and then uh, we'll start completely. So feel free to get to know each other who's sitting next to you, meanwhile. So can you ask Meryl and Christoph to sit here? Then we have Matthias and Robin. Robin is sitting there. Matthias Robin, would you like to join us? Thank you. We don't have name tags. Is this normal? No, here. Matthias. Does, does, no, does anybody know what Matthias spill camp looked like? Uh, yeah, I know Can when you? I met him, he was in, he was queuing at okay. some point. He was there. He was there. He asked me about the room. Okay, if you see number. him, yes. Can you wave to him? No, to I see him. him actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I heard Fe Frederick is ill. He is ill. Oh, that's so unfortunate. to do everything. Well, okay, let me explain. I already explained so to this them. Is, uh, this is Matthias. Um, the, the idea is that at this opening, you just introduce yeah, yeah, yeah. yourself. Yeah, sure, sure. Good morning. Yeah, which is true, but they just ask us to be here okay. to no just problem. like show who we are. I'm not sure about like how we'll be able to do the discussion. Yeah.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Berlin, IGF. Welcome to the session organized by the Council of Europe on artificial intelligence and discrimination, whose problem it is. Uh, I'm Irena Gedikova, Head of Division of Inclusion and Anti-Discrimination Programs at the Council of Europe. And I'm here with two colleagues, Meno Etema, who uh, in, already spoke to you this session, and he's leading some of our programs, in particular on uh, hate speech, no hate speech, and some anti-discrimination uh, field programs. And uh, Zeynep Kanzler, who is, I don't know if she managed to arrive in the room, but she will be with us uh, a little bit later. And I have uh, here uh, a number of distinguished experts in the field of uh, artificial intelligence who will introduce themselves later. Just a couple of words to open the session and uh, introduce the rationale. As you probably all know, our, our artificial intelligence applications are developing with really um, neck-breaking speed. I mean, we see new applications being reported practically every day. And all of this implies a lot of money in the economy. Yesterday, um, a study was introduced uh, that said that uh, 480 billion euros will be added to the German GDP thanks to artificial intelligence in the next five years. I mean, you can be as skeptical as you wish about uh, the calculation of of this amount, 13% more to the GDP in five years, just thanks to artificial intelligence, we can be skeptical. But at the same time, there is no question that the field is progressing extremely fast and with so much money involved, we can expect that there will be a few casualties along the way, apart from the gains. And we in the Council of Europe are very mindful that some of these casualties might involve uh, human rights. Of course, purely incidentally, it's uh, not intention, but along the way in this uh, brave new world, uh, we really need to remain extremely careful and watchful as to what impact on human rights and fundamental freedoms this, uh, these developments will have. And of course, it's not new. Already in the 80s, human decision-making was aided by data and algorithms, but the scale and the scope of the development here is, is really novel. And what is also novel is that essential decision-making has been delegated to machines, and especially to, to systems that do machine learning. So in the end of the day, we and even computer scientists start having very little control of what's going on within the self-learning algorithms, what's happening in the black box. So the Council of Europe is at the moment studying the, the case of whether we need some new regulation. Of course, we have a lot of regulation already. Uh, we have legislation that protects human rights, at least in Europe, at least in the Council of Europe member states, and prevents discrimination. But this might not be sufficient, and this workshop will, one of its tasks will be to examine whether we do need um, new regulation and how to better enforce the one that already exists. We are in dialogue already with member states, with um, artificial intelligence designers, so with the industry, and we are calling for a better link with institutions uh, that need to enforce and monitor the impact of artificial intelligence on human rights. The Council of Europe has already issued actually a few guidelines um, in uh, the field of data protection, as well as in the field of justice, of ethical guidelines, but also in a way soft standards of uh, how the governments can introduce measures uh, to ensure that there is no uh, drawback or fallback uh, on, on human rights. Uh, we're also working in the fields of education. We're, we're examining how elections are being impacted by algorithms. You know all the stories about manipulating elections, uh, including by foreign governments. In the field of bioethics, um, cybercrime, anti-corruption, etc. But our main topic here is artificial intelligence, and where we are coming from to this is, of course, through the Com European Convention of Human Rights and its Protocol 12. But 
Also through uh, a monitoring body that we have in the field of uh, anti-discrimination and um, intolerance called ECRI, European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. And this commission has already this year started understanding and learning how for its own work, which means monitoring how in member states uh, the situation is with um, discrimination, equality, hate speech, racism, how artificial intelligence uh, comes into the equation and what they can do to raise awareness, but also to identify cases uh, and how to raise awareness among civil society and the institutions. Finally, the Council of Europe just established a new intergovernmental committee which met last week in Strasbourg, the 47 member states, maybe some, I think some of you were there. Um, a new intergovernmental committee that, whose task is to assess the need for new regulation, whether gen, gen, generalist regulation, overarching regulation, which is probably not going to be the case, that's my hinge. It's very difficult to, to come up with one size fits all regulation on artificial intelligence. It might be sectoral, or the committee might also conclude that we don't need new regulation, but we need to enforce better what already exists and build capacity in those institutions that are supposed to protect us. So this committee should deliver its work in the next uh, couple of years, and um, it, will be, it will be work that is also quite participatory. Uh, it will be uh, also involving civil society and the industry. So I expect many of you might be involved in the future. Now, about the program today, uh, we have now until 12 o'clock, and we have chosen a method of work which is uh, interactive. There will be almost, there'll be no presentations from here, almost none. Uh, we would like to invite you to discuss with our experts on two main topics. First, to map what is already being done uh, in terms of um, identifying potential risks for discrimination and equality from artificial intelligence, who is doing it and what results are there, but also what gaps exist. Uh, you're representing here many, many different countries, so probably the situation is quite unequal, but we need your intelligence and your knowledge to understand where we are at this moment and what are the major um, gaps in the system. The second part, so this, you will remain in those working groups for two periods, the second period after the coffee break, I believe, do we have a coffee break? Yes. <laughs> we, will, uh, you, we will ask you to look into what should be the next steps. What are the most urgent new measures and actions that need to be undertaken to prevent uh, the further erosion of human rights and uh, equality uh, due to artificial intelligence applications? And our experts here will be the resource persons in those groups. They will lead the discussion, they will make inputs, they will start by telling their story and bring their knowledge and then you will continue um, the discussions in the groups. And at the end of the session, we will report, uh, the groups will report back to the plenary. So without further ado, I will like to introduce or ask our, our resource persons to introduce themselves. Maybe start with Matthias. There. Ah, okay, there is a button. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Matthias Spielkamp. I'm the co founder and executive director of Algorithm Watch. We are a non profit organization based here in Berlin, working internationally mainly uh, on European uh, and German issues of um, automated decision making. That's how we frame it. And uh, for example, in the process of this, we've prepared a report that is called Automating Society, taking stock of uh, automated decision-making in the European Union. I brought a couple of copies, about 10, because they're really heavy, and put them here, so they're maybe all gone, but it's on the internet, of course, so on the Algorithm Watch website you can find it. And of course, we are also looking at uh, discrimination issues that occur when automated decision-making systems are used. 
Hi, good morning. Krzysztof Izdebski from the Państwo Foundation. We are a civic tech organization, which means that we do technology, but we also write about it and do research. And uh, recently we made an in-depth research on the automated decision-making uh, processes uh, in relations uh, between the state and citizens. So this is our angle. We concentrate on algorithms, as we uh, name them. Uh, and uh, we also work on uh, very specific specific recommendations, especially when it comes to algorithmic impact assessment and usage of public procurement on a kind of a semi-regulatory uh, approach. Thank you. My name is Mil Koning. I work for Amnesty International. Um, Amnesty International is an international organization that works on all types of human rights, uh, including uh, the set of human rights that is impacted by algorithmic de decision making. Um, with MSD, we do research, so for example, in Europe there are certain research projects now into predictive policing systems that have alg algorithmic decision making built into them, but there's also uh, the part where we do recommendations. We made the Toronto Declaration. I encourage you to look it up. Uh, it's a set of uh, guidelines to uh, help set the uh, ethical standards for institutions, governmental bodies, and others who want to work with artificial intelligence. I just take the floor for one second to tell you that after the working group, first session of the working groups, I forgot to tell you, uh, then Mila Vidina and uh, Robin Allen here to my right side will be making a presentation about a recent research that they will tell you about now. Thank you for this introduction. Happy to be here in such a distinguished panel. And thank you to the Council of Europe and particularly to Irene and uh, to Meno for their continuing efforts in encouraging the contribution of European equality bodies to this important agenda. So my name is Mila Vidina. I'm a policy officer for the European Network of Equality Bodies. And Irene already mentioned several times uh, the possibility, the possible need of a new regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. Well, we already do have an existing framework that might do the job, or at least partially the job, when it comes to discrimination artificial intelligence, namely the European Equality and Anti-Discrimination Legal Framework. And equality bodies are the main actors entrusted with enforcing and implementing and monitoring this framework. Um, European uh, equality bodies are independent public bodies uh, set up by virtue of uh, EU um, equality directives. They provide independence assistance to victims of discrimination and work closely with civil society. And my colleague here, uh, Robin Allen, um, yeah, will tell you more about the research that uh, Equinet uh, is currently doing on the topic of artificial intelligence. Okay. Do I just talk? Hello, can you hear me all? Yeah, good. Um, my name's Robin Allen. Uh, I've been working in the field of equality law, believe it or not, since the 1970s. Uh, worked with the European Commission in the drafting and uh, text for the two uh, main 2000 directives. Um, and I've worked with equality bodies and lectured uh, across Europe all the way through my career. Um, I'm a barrister working in London, and uh, I, together with my business partner in my office, D Masters, uh, set up uh, AI Law Hub, which is a, a re resource for information about uh, AI ethics, about issues related to equality law, particularly in Europe, but also with information about the situation across the world. And uh, I'm working with Equinet on a project looking at the role of equality bodies in securing the enforcement of equality principles in the development and use of AI. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here talking with you and learning from you and working with this dis distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Now, on the program, uh, we were s supposed to have a presentation by Frederick Borgesius, um, professor of law at Radboud University in the Netherlands, who uh, finished, uh, carried out last year 
uh, a research for ECRI, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance about the effects of uh, artificial intelligence on discrimination. There are copies of this, uh, of this paper on the back, and of course it's also available online. Unfortunately, he was uh, he's at home with a flu, so uh, I uh, give you his uh, best greetings, and I will do my best just to say a few words about this study, although I've, I'm far from being a specialist on the topic, um, just to kick off the discussion. Uh, so the study uh, takes stock, and it, I must say it's already, I would say, quite outdated, because even since last year, so many new applications of artificial intelligence have happened, um, of where we find uh, artificial intelligence algorithms and systems in use in public and private systems. So I think we should all be extremely concerned about the use of artificial intelligence by public authorities. Uh, whether it will be in predictive uh, policing or in, uh, in the justice system, whether it will be for allocating social benefits, uh, access to housing benefits, or even visas. There is a recent case um, in the UK uh, that is a civil society organization filed a complaint about the possible uh, discrimination when uh, granting in the processing of visa applications towards nationals of certain countries, access to social assistance. It, I mean, I think the, the, the scope and width of applications is immense, and we see every day new cities and, and new governments deciding to enlarge and use, um, use algorithms and artificial intelligence in their work. And of course, it saves time. Uh, it saves costs, human labor. There are many good reasons for why you should use artificial intelligence, but you know, we, we need to step back, and they need to step back, and maybe do a few things before rushing into it. Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, applications in the private sector too, in banking, in insurance, in uh, assessing applications for education, for job applicants, etc., etc. Practically all areas of our life are, part, are being taken over, in a way, by machine, by machine decision making. And I'm not even talking about uh, self-driven cars and others, because there we have other human rights challenges, of course, in terms of right to life and safety, or other applications that have to do with privacy very much, with, you know, um, filter bubbles, advertisement, or even with the strength of our democracies. When we see and we hear stories how much manipulation of social media through algorithms uh, is, has impacted uh, some elections or referendums in some of our countries. And just yesterday there was a report of possible interference by China in Australian elections. Uh, you know, we realize that there, there is a lot at stake. Now the report goes on saying that we think we have strong legislation, at least in Europe we do, and in the, in the democracies, with solid democracies, there's strong legislation, primarily um, anti-discrimination and data protection legislation that needs to be triggered, that needs to be applied to those cases. But there are some caveats. Um, anti-discrimination legislation, generally speaking, most often applies to certain protected characteristics. Um, race, gender, age, uh, disability, and others. But of course, when it comes to making algorithms, you end up, or at least IT professionals and other order givers, and, and end up to bundling people into all kinds of groups because you need to assess, you know, you need to assess their case. Um, so you could be bundling them by postcode, you know, place of residence, by level of education, by income, or by other characteristics that do not necessarily directly fall under the protected grounds in most legislation. They could be shown through a legal case that, that there is a discrimination, but it's always going to depend on statistics. It's going to depend on access to those algorithms and the logic behind them. Uh, it's going to depend on the assessment by the courts of whether there is a, indeed a, a case of discrimination. So you need evidence to build those cases. So you need organizations or individuals that are aware enough that there is a potential for discrimination so that they actually raise these cases. 
And you need capacity, both in judicial system, but also in those that assist the victims, potential victims and NGOs that, uh, that could be uh, able to gather that evidence and, and audit whatever systems are used. And, and so that makes a lot of challenges, a lot of obstacles on the way to achieving a sustainable result. We have a few cases. Of course, we do have low cases, but you know, it's still a drop in the ocean of what's going on. Um, there's also the case of indirect discrimination, because uh, direct discrimination still you know, is relatively more straightforward. But when it comes to indirect discrimination, there's also the caveats where even the European Court of Human Rights or the EU law say, well, it's possible when there is a legitimate case, uh, indirect discrimination can apply, um, and when the means of achieving the, the aim are appropriate. So there is a lot of scope there for estimation of you know, whether it was indispensable to discriminate people to achieve a legitimate goal. And what is a legitimate goal? So the most important challenge the report says is to, first of all, make sure we enforce the existing legislation. Before rushing into new one, let's, let's see whether the, the existing ones can apply and how can we make it apply. How do we ensure transparency? Um, how we do regulate the auditing of algorithms, uh, which is one of the biggest challenges. Um, auditing algorithms directly, obviously it's not possible, uh, except for those of us who are lucky enough to be computer scientists. And even then, uh, self-learning algorithms, uh, how do you audit them? At some point you don't know where they are with the algorithm because it keeps changing when the system gets more data and uh, learns. And so, so it, that, that is an issue in itself. But also access, of course, as I said earlier, um, for especially for privately used algorithms, it's very difficult to obtain access to them and, and be able to understand how the code is set. Um, also, one of the remedies, and Christoph there is specializing in this, that the report recommends is preliminary risk assessments, especially for the use of algorithms in public uh, systems, before you even decide to order the computer scientists to write your code. Start by making a very strong case of do you really need it? Um, who will be impacted? What will be the gains and the costs versus the pros? And, um, and then how do you uh, mitigate the risks? I'm sure Krzysztof can tell you much about it later on. And finally, the report goes into who can drive uh, the developments in terms of policy making and in terms of public education, uh, in terms of advocacy, in terms of um, uh, strategic litigation, so that we make sure that the, the, the current legislation is adequately applied. And the report says, yes, the, of course, civil society has a very strong role, the industry to some extent, but primarily, and this is you know, our, our topic, uh, the equality bodies, human rights, uh, ombudsman institutions, uh, equality bodies in, in all of the, at least Council of Europe member states, but probably in other countries too. They themselves need to be educated, but of course, of course, they are filled mostly by legal professionals that do not necessarily have the, the, the knowledge and understanding of IT, how IT works. Um, they do not also, just like this, have the knowledge of where uh, artificial intelligence is applied and what risks it can uh, entail. So there is a need to build capacity in those equality bodies. There's also need to develop some kind of systematic cooperation with IT professionals so that they can draw on that expertise um, whenever they need it. They need to organize um, public awareness campaign campaigns, not, not to make citizens responsible for their own defense, because that's you know, against the principle of anti-discrimination. You, you don't tell people, oh, watch out, because you, you know, might suffer. Uh, no, it's more to, to make people aware they can recourse, they can apply uh, for judicial or non-judicial redress, or at least they can have some, some kind of protection as victims. 
But you also need public awareness in order to have constructive public debate. Because these are, in the end of the day, very much political decisions, and the public needs to be aware when voting or when participating in referenda, or just basically when having uh, participating in public discussion, uh, in discussions in the, in the press, to understand what we are talking about. Um, the equality bodies should also be able, in some cases, whenever their mandate allows it, to assess the data to assess the evidence that has been gathered for a particular discrimination case. And there, of course, they can either ask some specialists to do it, but they could also develop that capacity within their own membership, within their own staff, if they have the resources. Of course, the, mem the, the, the question of resources will always co come up. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe the equality body should try and make a strong case that in a situation where we have such massive artificial intelligence developments, they, they need additional resources. Um, they can also learn how to use, uh, how to develop uh, human rights and anti-discrimination impact assessments in advance and assist public authorities in implementing those. So they could have also an advisory role in that respect. They could also advise um, especially public authorities in the public procurement for IT systems and they could use strategic litigation uh, to highlight issues and develop a, a body of uh, relevant case law. There are probably other things, but that's already a big enough agenda. So with those conclusions from the report by Frederick Burgesius, um, we wanted to, to bring those conclusions to you and um, to ask you, as, as uh, specialists, I, I suppose many of you are specialists in our internet, issues or in law or in public policy um, to ask you, I will repeat the two questions for the working groups. First of all, what are the responses required to address the challenges? What are they already, what are we already doing? What are your organizations, your governments, your local authorities already doing to address the challenges and ensure a victim-centered approach? That's really important. Um, and what also still needs to be done? So that's the first question. The second question will come later after the presentation. And now Mena will uh, maybe try to help you organize in working groups. It's obvious that in this meeting room is not so easy. You might need to move some furniture, but hopefully not as much as, uh, you know, heavy lifting. Please, Mena. Yes, let's, whoa. Let's try to avoid heavy lifting. The idea was really to have an engaging, and I, it's great to see such a full room because diversity brings info, diversity brings more thoughts and richness to the discussion. So what we would like to have is three groups. And I would like to suggest that we create one group around these two tables here. So the challenge is here that you need to take one chair, turn it around, and you have a discussion table. Now, I see already the challenge that if we have three groups, we will have big, very big groups. So maybe we should split up even into smaller um, groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask to form full tables. So a table here and a table here. So to move around and to start talking with each other. A table here and table here. Okay, can we try to group a bit together? Because then we're going to split our experts over the various groups and they're going to explain a little bit more about their work. And then we also give the floor to all of you to start sharing what are you doing and how are you working on this topic. Oh, 45 minutes. Generous. Okay. So we have until half past 10 for this task. 45 minutes. So if you turn around your tables, your chairs, then you can form one group here. Well, great. That's good. Let's go. I'm Did you say four groups? Four? Four groups. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, then you go in the fourth group. <laughs> we'll work it out. No, Zeynep should come. Uh... Okay. That's got the presentation on. Who so we? Did you, you just save yours? I saved it yeah. to them. Yeah. Okay, good. 
All right. You're a note taker. Who is Ron? Where's Ron? Up. Ron is. I, I know what he looks like. If you turn around, then we can form a group here. I will go wherever you send me. Do you want me to go in group three? Go with me. All right. We don't want to leave in the middle. Then split out and listen to the other groups. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So join our oh. group. I'm glad you mentioned Toronto. Hello. It's uh, one of the earliest things I looked at. I can tell you. I'm going to jump in. I think it's there. Group three? Are you group three? Yeah, I think so. That's first. Okay, please try to form groups and then we'll just split the experts.
trade secret. One of the things that has been discussed in the United Kingdom is how these trade secrets can be the subject of the rule of law. And um, there is some historic basis in common law that's never discussed in the civil law. Um, one of our Supreme Court judges did a, an article presentation of the last week um, saying that it may be necessary in the future to have confidential legal proceedings in which the data set is brought and stretched. Whether that's a good idea,
dear gentle people, I invite you to wrap up the first round. We'll soon go into a presentation. Um, please stay where you're seated. So if you are facing the stage, just turn around the seat, but stay where you are, because then we can quickly continue the discussions in a few minutes. So wrap up the last sentence, and I ask the speakers to come forward. Okay, I, um, I ask you to take your seats. <laughs> While the presenters are slowly taking their, their places, um, I just wanted to, uh, maybe a quick show of hands, who found this first round of getting to know each other and discussing interesting? Just anything up? Good. Um, who learned something new? Ah, that's, that's a good score, that's great. Who is still frustrated about having to stand in this long queue this morning? <laughs> ah, that's not so many, that's good. So it was a good session because you already forgot the suffering of the first hour of today. 
Um, I see that Mila is sitting. So as Irina uh, introduced, um, we are now offering the floor to uh, Mila from Equinet, who will be speaking a bit more about the Equinet's work, also in the area of AI and discrimination. And then we'll have Alan uh, speaking about the study that is uh, underway, soon to be concluded, I think. So we'll have a sneak peek, if I understand correctly. After which, we will have another round of further discussion with a much more future-oriented look and so what's next and what can we actually do and, and the various roles that we play in this. Good, thank you. Then I give the floor to Mila, it's yours. All right, thank you very much, Mano. Um, okay, do we have the, the presentation screen? Excellent. Um, so I would try to be brief because you already heard a little bit about uh, what uh, European national equality bodies are. Um, so my presentation would uh, give you a brief overview of uh, what the different functions and responsibilities of independent uh, equality in public institutions are, called national equality bodies. Then I will tell you briefly about Equinet as, as their network, what we have been doing on artificial intelligence, and then uh, briefly highlight some possible roles that uh, equality bodies uh, have an obligation to play and could play with respect to artificial intelligence and what are some factors that would enable them to play those role more effectively and more independently. Um, okay, with, so what are um, national equality bodies? Um, as I already uh, mentioned, they're independent public institutions set up by virtue of uh, EU secondary legislation, and they've been set up across Europe to promote equality and tackle discrimination on a number of protected grounds. Um, gender, race, age, sexual orientation, religion and belief, disability, and in some countries the, um, the list, there is an open-ended list of grounds. Uh, equality bodies play a fundamental role in the non-discrimination architecture of the uh, of Europe. Um, the core mandate and mission of national equality bodies is the implementation of the EU directives like I mentioned. Um, they have been set up uh, by virtue uh, of the race equality directive of 2000 and then by three other uh, gender equality related directives. Um, since uh, the early years of their creation, since essentially the 2000, the year 2000, uh, their mandates have been uh, steadily but continuously expanding. For example, some equalities bodies have been entrusted with additional functions related to uh, freedom of movement within the European Union. So uh, with the right to equal treatment of uh, EU citizens who are living in a state different from their own. Also, they have acquired responsibilities uh, with respect to the work-life uh, balance. Uh, this year, the European Union adopted the work-life balance directive. Uh, so uh, now we have a three-year uh, deadline um, uh, till the first uh, for the uh, member states to transpose it. Another trend that should be noticed is that um, many of uh, the European equality bodies uh, have um, additional mandates not only in, in terms of their specific functions, such as work-life balance, freedom of movement, but also they have um, other roles and responsibilities. For example, they can be independent human rights institutions. Um, accredited by the UN, they can be ombudsman institutions, etc. Uh, finally, when we talk about equality bodies, keep in mind that there is a wide diversity of equality bodies set up across Europe. Uh, equality bodies differ in terms of their size, mandate, the protected grounds they cover, the resources they have, the institutional structure they're embedded in, um, and ultimately they vary in, in their different historical experiences as well. Um, how about Equinet as the network of equality bodies? Well, we currently uh, we are the only pan-European network representing European national bodies, and we are the first point of contact at the European level for information relating to equality bodies. 
Currently, we have 49 members from 36 countries, which means that uh, we also work with European neighborhood countries and EU candidate, potential candidate countries, so with countries that are members of the Council of Europe. Uh, first and foremost, uh, what we do is uh, capacity building, so supporting and enabling the work of national equality bodies. We also help uh, ensure the input of equality bodies uh, uh, into the development, uh, into policy and legislative developments uh, at the European level. So a representation of, of their voice and advocacy would be a, a second major function of the network. What have we done so far um, as a network of equality bodies on artificial uh, intelligence? Um, well, uh, to be fair, I should mention that we are just uh, starting. First, we identified um, an urgent and uh, glaring need to build the capacity of our members on this subject. Um, equality and non-discrimination uh, sometimes tend to be overlooked uh, when we talk about the negative human rights implications of the use of AI technologies. And we uh, wanted uh, to bring the topic of equality and non-discrimination to the forefront of the agenda. And we also wanted to highlight the role that equality bodies uh, could play in um, securing an equality compliant use of uh, AI driven technology. So we commissioned uh, research that uh, is currently being um, connected by a, by a wonderful team of uh, experts, uh, Robin Allen and Dean Masters uh, from the Cloisters Chambers. Uh, and this research is focused on the implications of artificial intelligence for equality and non-discrimination and the different uh, kind of developing a typology of the different interventions that equality bodies uh, could play in that context. Uh, then next year, we are based on the findings of the study, we are undertaking our first capacity building project, which would include uh, 40, uh, which is envisioned to, inc uh, to include roughly 45 equality bodies. And then we are in the process of discussing a potential further uh, capacity building project with the Council of Europe. Um, <clears throat> What have we achieved so far uh, since our uh, recent engagement with, with the topic? Well, we've strengthened the positioning of equality bodies and of their network, Equinet, vis-a-vis um, -vis other relevant stakeholders. For example, uh, we've had a dedicated meeting with the Council of Europe Human Rights Commissioner on the topic of uh, AI and discrimination and the, equality, and the role that equality bodies could play there. We made a, a submission uh, to a report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism and Racial Discrimination. And we are uh, developing a potential contribution um, in the form of a, to a 2020 opinion of the European Commission Advisory Committee of Equal Opportunities Between Women and Men. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of the, let's see, it's the, the research. Um, just very briefly, uh, the main outputs or products we are hoping to get out of this research is uh, kind of an overview of what are the implications of artificial intelligence systems for, for equality and equality bodies. As I said already, a typology of possible interventions. On a more practical level, we hope to, to develop a checklist for equality bodies to assess the equality compliance of different AI technologies then have a set of recommendations of equalities, how they can use their powers, expertise, and resources to better position themselves in the public discourse nationally on AI. And finally, at, uh, at the European level, um, produce a list of policy, legislative, and regulatory issues that uh, equality bodies could uh, usefully engage with in order to position themselves better at the European level. Um, very briefly, uh, what do equality bodies actually do? What are their roles? If we are going to discuss what roles they have with respect to artificial intelligence, uh, we should know what are their obligations and duties under the, the relevant le uh, EU legislation in this case. 
Uh, well, the, the functions that are explicitly laid out by the directives uh, is provision of independent assistance to victims of discrimination. So you can um, think of this as the hardcore legal work. This is complaints handling. Uh, so legal support and assistance. Also, this includes litigation, um, including strategic litigation. Then independent service and reports concerning discrimination on all the issues concerning in the discrimination. Uh, so this is uh, building or contributing to the building of national knowledge base uh, and data hub on, on equality research and data. So uh, the evidence that you need for uh, driving policy developments in the field of equality. Then also you have, they have an obligation to make recommendations to, to governments, uh, they can make recommendations on uh, draft legislation and draft uh, policy, for example, policy strategies, action plans, etc. This is uh, the so-called advisory function, which is key, especially with respect to, to preventing discrimination from happening. And finally, exchange of information with other European bodies, including within our network. How about other wider functions that are not explicitly given to equality bodies, but um, that are implied or hinted at in, in the legislation? Well, equality bodies also do awareness uh, raising and broader promotion of tolerance, inclusion, and, and values. Um, they also do promotion of good practices. For example, in the, in the field of disability, a very practical use of this is creating uh, um, good practice guides on reasonable accommodation for employers and service providers. They also work with a range variety of stakeholders uh, because they're uh, at, the at the front line of providing assistance with victims. They are often very well acquainted with the civil society organizations that provide support to victims. They work with trade unions. Uh, they work uh, with employers. Um, as I've already noticed this in my discussion group, one of uh, the features that distinguishes equality bodies from other European human rights structures is the fact that, that they very often have a mandate after the private sector. Uh, and last but not least, they have some monitoring and supervision responsibility. For example, many of them have monitoring and reporting duties not only under European uh, legislation, both um, European Union and Council of Europe, but also under uh, UN obligations, so international uh, obligations, under the different uh, conventions. Okay, and Building on, on those roles of equality bodies, uh, which, and taking them into consideration, um, which of those functions can be most usefully uh, utilized with respect uh, to tackling AI-driven discrimination? Uh, we would propose that uh, equality bodies uh, have a particularly strong role to play when it comes to investigating cases of discrimination then have a strong uh, uh, role when it comes to assessing um, whether there is algorithmic uh, discrimination. Uh, also, uh, in terms of providing, uh, uh, ins ensuring access to legal address or being the source of legal redress themselves when the equality bodies have decision-making powers themselves and also being able to uh, impose sanctions. Awareness raising among rights holders, so building um, rights literacy and AI literacy among the community. And last but not least, training of duty bearers, which in this case would be both state authorities and the private sector. Uh, to play all those uh, roles, what are the factors that would enable equality bodies to fulfill those, uh, those roles? Um, I would uh, quickly mention um, three, uh, I've clustered those factors into three main groups. The first three groups are, I've called structural or institutional factors, and they're not specific to equality bodies, they're specific to all actors if they want to meaningfully contribute to preventing and tackling AI-driven discrimination. And the last uh, factor are specific to, to, um, nas to national equality bodies. So the first uh, group of factors are the so-called transparency tra uh, safeguards. There should be transparency with respect to the decision to use AI-based technologies. 
Uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted that in every case AI technology should be used, and whenever they use, there should be a legislative uh, basis and there should be opportunities for legislative debate and public input. There should be transparency of the legal and policy basis for the use of AI. So what policies and laws are we implementing when using AI technologies? There should be transparency at the third level as well of the public and private uses of AI. So there should be mandatory registers of all public authorities using AI technologies, but why not also make it incumbent upon the private sector to create uh, such registers as well? And a fourth level of transparency, there should be a transparency of responsibility, uh, which ensures that there is access to effective remedies. Um, so uh, a second enabling of uh, factor, um, I've, we've called accountability safeguards. Um, so uh, accountability can be achieved through um, regulation, for example, ensuring that there is monetary compensation or the rec reconciliation mechanisms. Uh, it can be ensured through co-regulatory approaches, for example, industry standardization, such as the ISO standards or the fair trademark. Uh, it can also be ensured through organizational structures of accountability governments, for example, internal ethics panels or boards, or designated ethics uh, um, uh, officers. Um, and finally, uh, an initial factor uh, enabling uh, equality bodies and other actors to contribute to tackling AI-driven discrimination is this, what we've called the so-called ecosystem or partnership-based approach. This essentially means that governments should encourage or even make it mandatory that all um, stakeholders uh, work together. So they should uh, make mandatory the consultation of national equality bodies with industry representatives, public authorities, civil society, which includes both digital rights advocates, but also civil society organizations representing vulnerable communities. Um, and within this ecosystem, I think it's important to also mention the role of finance and investment of uh, kind of big financial interest. Uh, so the role, the, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and leading, uh, leading Fund, fund, excuse me, funding leaders should also be included in the dialogue as they're also driving large-scale AI developments. And a final um, enabling factor uh, is specific to national equality bodies only. So we mentioned transparency, accountability, working in partnership, and then finally something that would be particularly enabling for national equality bodies, namely the implementation of the so-called European standards for equality bodies. What are those standards, you, you would ask? Well, when I mentioned that equality bodies are set, set up by virtue of EU directives, that they're statutory bodies, um, and I um, uh, touted some of the virtues of, of equality bodies, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is a, there, was, there wasn't much, uh, aside from making mandatory the setting up of those equality bodies and listing with, uh, in very general terms four main functions for them, the equality directives didn't provide a sufficient level of specificity and detail when it comes to um, uh, explaining uh, uh, more specific responsibilities and the way they would be implemented at the national level. Hence, the need to develop standards for equality bodies, and those standards are broadly focused on two main uh, goals, the effectiveness, uh, ensuring effectiveness of equality bodies, and ensuring their independence. Those standards, uh, such standards have been developed by both, with, well, have been developed both within the Council of Europe framework in 2018 uh, by, uh, the, by a CRI, uh, by an update of their general policy recommendation number two. And within the framework of the Uni European Union, they've been uh, developed uh, as a recommendation by the European Commission uh, in June 2018. 
Those standards are useful when it comes to AI because they give us arguments to advocate for giving more powers and more resources to equality bodies. Those powers are needed in order for them to be able to fulfill their uh, roles with respect to investigation. Uh, currently, um, in a sizable number of, of, um, of European states, equality bodies have limited powers to investigate. For example, they don't have access to data sets. Uh, they don't have access to third-party premises. Um, they have um, limited powers and resources, importantly, when it comes uh, to assessment. Um, they need uh, to be able to have the resources to procure the, ne the necessary technical um, expertise to be able to assess whether a particular um, whether a particular data set or the way um, a, co a computer code is uh, designed, developed and deployed is discriminatory. Um, and last and but not least, they need more powers when it uh, comes to the sanctions regime um, with respect to equality bodies. Uh, sanctions, uh, there is a stipulation in the directive that says that there should be effective, proportionate and dissuasive sanctions, but other than this standard, more detail is required. Uh, many uh, states have um, set sanctions that are too low. Some of them have not provided uh, any monetary, uh, monetary sanctions. Um, and sometimes uh, sanctions are not applied in the absence of a specific uh, victim. Um, so this is it uh, from me for now. And then Robin would uh, go in greater detail about the results of our um, research on AI and equality bodies. Yeah. <laughs> That's working, I don't know where it's going here. Thank you. Where's the mouse? <coughs> Hello, everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, well, I'm following on from Miller. Um, my name's Robin Allen. I'm a barrister in London. Uh, I've been in one of the workshops with you, and you'll have heard at the beginning, I've been working in equality law for a very long time indeed, and um, have really engaged uh, with my colleague Dee Masters in my office uh, through the AI Law Hub. Hang on, it's not up there, the picture. Yes, it is. There we go. Um, do bookmark that website. It's a really, um, we think it's a really good resource, full of information about um, what's happening in the world uh, about uh, ethics and the development of legal rules in relation to AI. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing with Equinet. Um, so, I think you all know this chap here. I'm not sure what gender he or she has. It's knit, really. Um, but the question is, where is AI and automated decision-making happening in Europe? Well, with Equinet, we carried out a piece of research, and we had responses, as you can see on this map, from just about everywhere within the Equinet body, and, uh, or group of bodies, uh, of national equality bodies. 
Um, you'll see that it includes Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, oops, sorry, go on one more, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, and a host of others as well. So, what types of AI and automated decision-making is occurring? Well, an enormous amount. The research that we've carried out shows recruitment processes is a key one. I've just been looking recently at a paper. We think that literally hundreds of millions of pounds and dollars and euros have already been raised for recruitment processes using artificial intelligence. Uh, for monitoring the unemployed to decide what uh, benefits they might get, how they should be put back into work, whether they should be in work or not. Uh, we've seen it for predictive policing, where police should be sent, what uh, kind of policing should take place. For credit scoring, for risk assessments of all kinds for the insurance industry, for medical diagnosis, for administering social advantages, housing benefit, social security payments, for facial recognition in many different contexts, and indeed even for access to education. So those are the ones that, the ideas that came back to us through the research, but we're also very aware that it is being used for online marketing as well. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. So what was the level of awareness by quality bodies within Equinet? Well, 30 equality bodies responded to our survey, and we've communicated with a further five equality bodies. 70% were aware of discussions in their legislatures, in their parliaments, about AI. 60% were aware of a public debate. But this is a really important one here. Look at the knot in red. 70% of respondents said they were not, as of now, defining best practice to avoid discrimination from AI. So there's a big task ahead. And 60% of respondents said that they were considering or had started taking some form of action. Now, despite the fact that we know that the engagement is still a long way off full, there are some positive steps being taken. Obviously, the Council of Europe here today doing a lot of work on raising awareness. It's why we're here today. The European Commission high-level expert group is working on this issue at present. And indeed, we know that the incoming president of the Commission, um, together with the uh, director of Digital Europe um, in, within the Commission, will be bringing forward ideas about legislation in the near future. The Fundamental Rights Agency has been doing work on this within uh, the European Union as has the European Data Protection Board. And there is a lot of work going on on country pace discussion on ethical AI guidelines. Um, I like this one. Malta, one of the smallest parts of the European Union, is trying out a certification scheme for AI. And there are many examples of equality bodies collaborating with government bodies and private companies to discuss, discuss equality issues. Um, some more things to tell you. There's some litigation going on. Uh, there's a case called Bridges, which looked at uh, the use of facial recognition technology in the United Kingdom. And the Siri litigation, if you don't know about that, you should definitely follow it. In the Netherlands, extremely important, looking at uh, the way in which um, 
uh, the state should distribute social advantages looking at uh, multiple databases. Um, equality bodies are already issuing decisions. Uh, the French equality body in relation to education in the parcours sub. All of this you'll find more details of on the AI Law Hub. And some studies have been commissioned. These are just examples. Sweden is looking at a public register of algorithms. Academics, we know, are producing reports. So those are ideas and things that are actually happening of engagement through equality bodies looking at the issues that are emerging. But there's some other stuff that's interesting going on at the moment, which is business is beginning to realize that uh, quality issues are becoming very important and have begun to ask questions about machines, how machines should understand equality issues. And there's a dialogue to be had there which we need to engage with as well. So some practical ap actions uh, to take that have emerged from our research. We are absolutely clear that it's critical to develop a new knowledge base about AI across Europe and indeed through the world. We also realize increasingly that we need to think harder about what equality means. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. We need to keep each other informed, so building networks is critical. And we need to monitor what is happening. In our little discussion group this morning, one suggestion was whether we should have a register of examples of inequality that's happening across the world. And we need to make wider connections and to start proposing legislation fit for purpose. And just a little bit about all of those, not very much. That's my colleague D having a discussion with a robot. And um, here she is. This is some of the issues that have emerged. We know that 30% of the respondents to the survey we've carried out didn't actually know about the European Union's projects on AI. And just under 20% didn't know about the Council of Europe's initiatives either. So we think a desktop review of ethics principles and legal principles, how they engage with AI, is essential in every single country. We suggest that there should be work done on a gap analysis within each country, perhaps through a public inquiry, that, equity, um, uh, 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 that um, equality bodies, national equality bodies, should start having a dedicated staff member who's responsible for the whole agenda in relation to AI, that they should identify connected areas of law, data protection, commercial law, competition law, and that they need to start bringing in data experts, PhD students, academic support groups, and so on. We've also realized a lot of work needs to be done to think harder about equality. Um, I can talk more about this later on, but an awful lot of work on developing AI and machine learning is happening in the United States. And the whole driver for the idea of equality in the United States is built on its history with slavery. Uh, and in particular, the difficulty that black Americans have had in being full members of American society. So, American equality law is built often on ideas of looking for pattern or practices that indicate intentional but hidden discriminatory intent. In Europe, we take a different approach. Uh, we don't think that it's necessary always to try and work out whether there was an intent. We just need to show whether or not there is a practice which has disadvantage for protected characteristics. So these are different ideas, 
And we need to make sure that our ideas are not tripped up by the way in which equality is being looked at across the pond. We also need to make sure that AI can work positively to advance the equality agenda and not just look at formal equality, but can actually help with substantive equality. If any of you are lawyers in Europe, you'll know that there is a developing body of case law about the importance of eliminating disadvantage connected with protected characteristics. It's called working towards substantive equality. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done to see how AI can help with that too. We also very clear from our report that we need to connect with other regulators and other specialist bodies. <coughs> there are a raft of them that will be very obvious. Only 50% of Equinet's members are actively considering working with other regulators to tackle discrimination from AI and automated decision making. Yet, data protection regulators are really important here, and so are competition and market authorities. <coughs> you have to forgive me, I'm fighting a cold, so if I sound a bit croaky, I apologize. Uh, there are also consumer protection authorities that can help, and employment rights bodies, and education specialists, all of whom have got a role to play, as well as the financial service regulators in countries. <coughs> and in some countries, there are separate from equality bodies national human rights institutions, and they are part of the story as well. So building those connections and realizing that equality is only one of a raft of human rights values is very important. <coughs> we also need to think about whether the legislation and the guidance on the use of artificial intelligence within countries is fit for purpose. Is it leading up a stairs to somewhere? or to a black hole which doesn't work at all. And that's where the gaps analysis is so important. And we propose that within each of the member states that have got equality bodies within Equinet, there should be action to meet the gaps that are identified through the audit process. And this requires some quite difficult thinking because Legislation takes time to make. It's not always as good as it should be. And sometimes it's more helpful to have soft law through guidance, through codes of practice, which can be more specific and sometimes can engage more actors who are key and be more appropriate. But whatever else is done, training is critical. If you think you don't know very much about AI, I promise you the judges in your country know even less than you do. It's a fact. And so working with judges and all social actors and government on a training program is absolutely critical. And we look forward within uh, uh, DNI with Equinet and Council of Europe in trying to think harder about the kind of training that will be necessary for those purposes. And that involves, of course, considering wider impacts across Europe, because whenever artificial intelligence is used in one country, business will think immediately it can be used in another and another and another. So what's the big takeaways? Keep informed. Follow us on Twitter at AI Law Hub. We tweet frequently about these issues. Uh, there's AIIA org to follow. Algorithm Watch, a terrific website and uh, Twitter handle. Matthias is here somewhere. Where are you? Stand up for a moment. 
great guy, terrific. <laughs> really, really good stuff. So bookmark some of these different uh, ideas here. Summary, develop a new knowledge base, make connections, propose legislation fit for purpose, keep informed. And I think that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mila. Um, as agenda, we wanted to go back to the smaller groups to have a further discussion about the various results. Um, and um, so what I want, in the, in the next round, we would like to further discuss actually, okay, so whose problem is it? And based on the input now that we had from Alan about the possibilities and uh, opportunities to address it and the roles of equality bodies, I think the discussion we are now looking into is what are the various roles and responsibilities of different actors in the field to address this issue? Um, and to really look at the different stakeholders, the challenges that they have, and how their roles can be enhanced, and how cooperation between the various stakeholders can be further enhanced to actually address the challenge that's before us. So when we're talking about different stakeholders, we're talking uh, very much about the equality bodies, which is Alan's uh, perspective has just been presented, and. Uh, the role and the function of equality body has been presented by Mila. But of course we have also the national authorities, local authorities, for example municipalities and others, uh, European authorities or intergovernment organizations, civil society actors, um, and the industry. And also the users themselves, I would say, add to this list. So the question is how can we further strengthen their various roles and responsibilities in addressing the issue of AI and discrimination or algorithmic decision-making processes where they're being used in the chain and uh, address them, <coughs> the potential consequences of discrimination. What we're going to do is, I didn't open the floor for the questions for Alan. What I wanted to do is kick off another round of discussions, a little less than half an hour, just to have brainstorm, because your inputs will feed Equinet, the Council of Europe, and our partners for further programmatic development, capacity building programs, uh, maybe legislative initiatives. There is an AI intergovernmental committee on the Council of Europe. We are working with the EU who also has initiatives of that. So this is the moment for you to bring up points that you think should be taken forward, capacities that we should strengthen or other actions that should be taken. And we want to take that in for about 25 minutes or so. Then we go back to plenary and we get a feedback from all the various groups and we'll have a further discussion on the various points that were raised. So we first want to give the floor to you, and then we bring everything together. The panelists will sit in the front, we'll hear back from the discussions, and there's further space for discussion, as long as you want to hang out. I think lunch will probably prevent, give a natural end to the session. So can I have again group one, two, three, and four, and ask the panelists also to take the various groups again, lead the discussion, and we meet in plenary, Where's my time? Yes, so we have about uh, 25 minutes.
can I ask the, the groups to finish their sentence? And then the rapporteurs from the various groups to come forward and the speakers also to be available. So we'll have a plenary closing, feedback and closing. So turn your tables or turn your, sorry, your chair so you can face front again. And then we'll receive feedback from all the groups and what was discussed. Okay, so could everybody get ready to face the front? And can I ask the speakers to come closer to the front and also the rapporteurs from each working group? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you for holding on. Um, did anybody spot the lie of the day? Check. You get to be in front of the line when we finish. <laughs> Irina promised a coffee break, but there was none. So that was the lie of the morning. <laughs> but I'm happy to know that people are awake. Thank you. Um, how was the second round? Was it useful? Yes, a show of hands, useful? Good. Was it interesting? Yes, okay, good. Learned something new? Good. Missing the coffee? <laughs> That's not too bad, actually. Okay, good. It probably means that you didn't have coffee and half of the group is asleep. But anyway, no, you responded very actively. I'm, uh, the, we had two working rounds, two working groups. The first one was, okay, what's happening already? What are the challenges of... AI and discrimination, and many groups already discussed AI is a wrong term. We should be talking about algorithmic decision making or something like that. So let's try to learn algorithmic decision making and discrimination. 
So that was what's already happening, what are the challenges? First round, we had the presentations. In the second round, we were talking, okay, how can we strengthen capacity, the legislation issues, what, what could be done, and how can we give the roles of the various stakeholders more prominence and more strength? So we are going to now collect the feedback from the various groups. I would like to ask the rapporteurs to be uh, complementary. In other words, the first rapporteur might be most lengthy, and then the others start adding new things or things that were not discussed uh, by the previous rapporteur, so that we move forward quickly. And then there's some space for further questions and answers. Just to recall, this is part for us for a process. So your inputs are very valuable to us because we are, as in a partnership, working towards more uh, standards uh, or legislative or soft law, but also capacity building programs. So all your inputs will be taken uh, forward. While the rapporteurs are getting ready, are the rapporteurs ready? Yep. Yes, kind of, good. Then I'll just want to mention that at the end of the room, there is a list where you can write your name and, and organization and email. And if you write your email, you'll get a kind of like summary of this, this morning, but also all the relevant links of reports and things that were mentioned and links to newsletters in case you want to join any newsletters. We will not sign you up to anything. You'll have to do it yourself. You'll just get one email with information and links and then it's up to you, okay? Good. There are also publications at the end from the European Commission on Human Rights, uh, Unboxing AI, and the study of the Council of Europe on algorithmic decision-making and discrimination. I give the floor now to our esteemed colleagues. Um, working group one was here in the front. Is it okay to give that group first the word and then the others to add on? It's an obvious choice, I think. Sorry, yes. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, we had a, we had great discussions. Um, um, very knowledgeable group from different perspectives. So we have uh, equality bodies, um, but also the people representing the business sector at some point and civil society organizations. Um, what we thought was the most important uh, problem in a terms of thinking about the regulating and understanding automated decision making, by the way, we agreed at the very beginning, we try not to use AI. So often we try to refer to automated decision making thing, whether it's more automated or less automated. We had a, another discussion on that in the context of Article 22 of GDPR. Uh, but basically what we agreed apart from uh, the terminology is that we uh, have a great problem with a lack of knowledge. Uh, within the public body itself as well, and judges, as was also uh, told during the uh, judicial, during uh, the, the presentation. We're also discussing the need of independent audits, and uh, we had some points of uh, potential certification of uh, certain automated decision making, but then we saw the risk of certifying the algorithm working in a very specific context why the same algorithm can be used in the authoritarian regime for a, a very um, bad uh, but things. Um, so, um, there's, but for sure, there is a there is a strong need to discuss whether we will show it an algorithmic. We'll call it algorithmic impact assessment, or any any other uh, mean to control the algorithm between before it is actually uh, implemented. We also been discussing what is the motivation of companies in this regard to reveal the data because the second part um, what, of of our discussion was devoted to the uh, problems with freedom of information loss in this regard as well. Um, so it is connected with the fact that uh, public offices, they don't have enough information very often, but also there is a, a problem with like the limits within the freedom of information law either in themselves, including the, the trade secrets and uh, its impact also on external uh, assessment in, in a consequence. Um, when it comes to the question on like who is responsible, uh, we were discussing whether we need a new body in the term, and actually 
remind if I was wrong, but I, I understood that we really don't actually at that moment, at least. What works beautifully, and I, I think we should um, uh, we should praise that, is that thanks to the whole debate on automated decision making, we have a good example of multi-stakeholders groups and uh, exchange between the different public bodies. So when we were discussing who can be responsible for managing the problem, whether it is equality bodies or the data protection authorities, we said this is a cross-sectoral topic. Uh, so the good coordination is, is needed. And maybe even at the very end, not new regulations, but more specific regulation, because discrimination is a discrimination. It doesn't matter whether it's done by the machine or directly by the human being. Uh, so thinking about um, trying to uh, find out the, the new way of regulating the thing uh, might lead us uh, to some, uh, some problems if forgetting what the discrimination is in uh, Fact and yeah, I think Ron, can you support me on um, this? Just um, on the last question, whose problem is it? Um, so there, there was sort of um, a shared um, understanding um, about the budgetary constraints and resource constraint that was uh, mentioned quite uh, several times, and I think um, that there was also the question of um, how much. Precise should the, uh, the 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 measurements of um, uh, of um, of evidences should be done by uh, by different um, uh, by by different uh, equality bodies so the system doesn't hack itself. Um, so um, and on the first question. So on the first question, there was also mentioned uh, the question of uh, access to information, uh, but most importantly, um, the way how we communicate uh, this access to information, especially to the private data, and the awareness of the public. Uh, so how much the public is uh, aware of its own data and the decisions that they make, how much consciousness they are about the decisions they make. So. Yeah, and, and the very specific point we made actually in terms maybe of, uh, of the future regulation is that we want to see the proactive way of informing about the usage of algorithms. And this is like, yeah, I should underline that. It's, it's, it's a simple thing that it's not that we uh, want to get it on the request uh, for freedom of information, but uh, the uh, public entities and companies should be obliged to determine whether they use algorithms uh, in the first place. Thank you very much. Is there from group one anything that needs to be added? Something that the two rapporteurs forgot to mention? No, then we move on to uh, group two, a little bit down the corridor. So Chisho's last comment was uh, is uh, very good to follow up on because this is what we discussed um, intensively, this requirement to publish the use of such systems and that we have a huge challenge ahead of us in defining what they are. Um, because we also agree that AI is uh, certainly not uh, a good term to frame this, but at the same time automated decision making is not perfect either. Uh, it is very, very hard to identify when there is a impact that should be regulated and when there isn't. Um, and this is not something that we have solved yet. Um, and there was basically a lot of uh, agreement on this in, the, in, in our group. Now, um, taking this as a uh, segue, then um, we would, a, would I would be able to echo most of what you just said because those points also came up in our group. Um, there were a couple of additional ones that I'll try to focus on. First of all, uh, there is this a burden on civil society and researchers to find out about these cases because, I mean, you could argue that because there is no such register, but also because there is little uh, research being done on this. Uh, and at the same time, it is sometimes hard for individuals to 
um, make a claim because it puts a lot of pressure on them. So, for example, when we're talking about strategic litigation as one form of addressing this, then it always puts a lot of burden and pressure on an individual who needs to argue that case, even if he or she has support by organizations. Um, and this is uh, also a funding issue, of course. Then. Um, there needs to be this multi-stakeholder approach to this, the uh, cooperation of uh, human rights organizations, public authorities, and others. Uh, you already mentioned that as well. Um, and what I think did not come up in the summary of what you just said was very in, uh, important in our group that um, participants said that there is little expertise in the um, organizations that you know need to take care of this or need to deal with this, be it public sector or um, others, but that is a big obstacle to addressing these questions because sometimes it is even hard to um, talk about the fact that we need to look at algorithms and artificial intelligence systems because some colleagues become scared uh, because of this alone and are not uh, motivated to work on this. Now, let me check. Um, yeah, and then was there was one um, argument that was made, or one point that was raised that I find very important for our discussion here, that um, it's not just that it's hard to frame the system itself, but also the purpose. So um, there can be discrimination that is the result of, for example, using complex systems to allocate resources. Now, if you use these systems, for example, for predicting some kind of demand, um, we are not really talking about any kind of automated decision making because the decision then is basically taken uh, at a political level. But if the system that is being used is informing the political decision making process so intensely, then the result can again be a discrimination. But it's very hard to come up with any mechanisms to address this, because this is, you know, similar to uh, gathering intelligence right now, whether it is gathered by humans or machines, it's hard to distinguish. So we have consequences that um, we fail to see right now how we can address them, uh, even if we could, you know, come up with any kind of law that we would like to and not even consider the political process of how to enacting that. Okay, I, I, I would wrap it up here. There was, of course, a lot of things being said, so I'm looking at my group. Is there anyone who would like to add something to this? Okay. From group two, anything to add? I saw somebody nearly, nearly wanting to do it, but no? Okay. Well, there will be a last round of discussion also, so if there's anything else that is not being said yet. We'll come back to that in a minute. Thank you, Group 2. It was very fruitful. Uh, group 3. Okay, uh, the group three also had similar discussions like the group uh, one and two, but apart from the um, this, this, um, topics already mentioned, uh, I would add on, I mean, like the regulation threshold and the issue of transparency, that it's an unresolved issue. We also uh, discussed about, um, one point was raised, if there was a regulation, uh, there has to be a specific also emphasis on the um, cross-border nature of the issues and that it has to be also taken into consideration at the making of any kind of regulation. If there was going to be a treaty or it's a, if we are going to aim a big uh, convention at the level of uh, intergovernmental organizations, this cross-border issues should be very clear, uh, clearly defined and, uh, and uh, framed from the very beginning. That was one point uh, from our group. And the other um, um, issue that I can mention uh, that um, when we were discussing about who is responsible question, um, uh, one of the participants was mentioning that we are so much thinking about the content, but we are not thinking so much about the process. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's something uh, to really uh, reflect on that we also have to um, uh, place emphasis on the uh, processes um, apart from the potential discriminatory effects of the ADMs or uh, the other uh, artificial intelligence um, discriminatory effects of the uh, AI. 
And um, one yet other uh, perhaps point I would make from the group three, uh, we also had discussions about the different models proposed. For instance, we had a, a discussion about the recent German proposal um, uh, about um, how to define the uh, harm or the severity of the discrimination because in the recent German model proposed a couple of weeks back in the report that they are offering uh, five levels of severity. So, uh, so this, this was something uh, that we um, discussed and um, the potential supervision for each level of severity. Um, but um, then uh, here there was one um, uh, fruitful discussion uh, while we were talking about the potential um, um, model to give uh, AI a partial legal capacity, which is uh, strictly um, uh, opposed by the German data authority so, uh, as the EU high-level expert group. So it can be a matter of uh, discussion in our, uh, also um, in our group three. And one last thing, maybe I can just mention the importance of education. Education uh, for industry, uh, representatives, but also for the policymakers and judges, because uh, they have to understand the uh, consequences of these tools and their potential uh, impact at different levels. Um, and it shouldn't be restricted to uh, intentional discrimination, but also, of course, to unintentional discrimination. This was also uh, underlined by our group. So if I forget anything, please, um, our uh, colleagues uh, would help me. So that's all I can say at this stage. Thank you, Zeynep. Is there from the group three anything that needs adding or emphasizing? No, I take silence as an agreement then with the presentation, knowing that already lots of other points that you might have raised were also mentioned by the first uh, two presenters. Thank you very much. Um, the last group is number four. Uh, who do I give the floor to? Thank you. Thank you. Well, not much left to say. Um, something that struck me as, as missing or even uh, contradictory to what some of the colleagues said before, um, we put a lot of emphasis both in uh, discussions within um, the, first, the first discussion round and then the second discussion round on uh, awareness raising among rights holders. So educating the general public about their rights and what, are the, the, what specific pathways for legal redress they have. Uh, and we place this responsibility uh, not so much with uh, civil society or not even with uh, specialized human rights and equality bodies, but actually with government. Um, uh, in terms of uh, something that was different in our group, um, when uh, uh, creating visibility on the scale uh, and the depth of the problem of um, AI-driven discrimination. The burden should not be, at least according to our discussion, uh, was not so much placed on civil society and researcher as again on the government because uh, we suggested that potentially the government uh, should have an obligation to create a publicly an open registry of, uh, with all public uses of AI technologies or maybe even make it mandatory for the private sector to, to declare uh, every time they use an a, a AI technology that might uh, adversely affect citizens' rights. Uh, of course, this would uh, depend on the, on the application of, of the technology and on the scale of the impact on the individual, the affected group, or the society as a whole. Uh, what else did we uh, mention? Yeah, uh, again, placing the burden on government. Uh, we discussed in several different, uh, with several different ideas, the importance of creating a national strategy um, to ensure a, a broad cross-sectoral approach to um, to regulating and monitoring the human rights implications of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we also uh, emphasize the important role of um, intergovernmental organization or supranational organizations also um, in facilitating um, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, committees with representatives of industry, civil society, public authorities um, that uh, 
on, on, the, on the very same topic and also the importance of civil society uh, actors for ensuring uh, general AI literacy. Uh, I might be missing something. Please help me. Anyone in my group? call for help from Mila. Yeah. Um, group four, anything to add? Anything that was not mentioned yet by any of the rapporteurs? Please. Ah, yes, thank you. Yes, just a, a very short thing because I think it's relevant to mention that the, yesterday during the Youth Summit, this topic was discussed, and they, they, we are making a, a big effort on, on sending these messages like this: uh, human intervention must guide AI-driven decision making to ensure explainability, inclusivity, privacy, and accountability, and the right to appeal. And in relation to this, there is a second message also that the youth uh, organizations would like to, to, to send is companies should be transparent on their algorithms, data, content rules, and decision making to uphold trust and responsibility. So it's in line, but it's just to also to highlight the, the worries and the messages from the youth sector. Yeah, indeed, I, I didn't uh, mention the element of humor control or human uh, oversight. Huh? So there is no, n not a complete autonomy of, of the technology, uh, especially important for uh, machine learning. Thank you very much. And you mentioned there's two declarations. So one is the youth uh, declaration that has been created the last few days and should be public at the end of the day, I understood. Uh, there's a press conference at quarter past four. Anybody wants to join? And the first one was, which statement was that? decision-making process, but that was a statement from also the youth delegation or the... Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, good, the youth thank you. From, yeah. Okay, so both of them yeah. are from the youth delegation and they'll present, yeah. present them this afternoon at quarter past four. Thank you very much. Anything else to add? No. I think it has been a very rich discussion uh, and, and it just comes to show that by uh, bringing people together from many different backgrounds and opening the space, there's actually a lot of richness and information out there. And now it's about bringing this all together. So we have been taking notes all over the place and we'll try to bring this a bit together and share, the, bring this back to you. Um, I wanted to ask if anybody wanted to respond on the, the summaries, maybe also from the panelists, was there any final concluding words or thoughts on uh, what could be the next steps for us as uh, the Council of Europe, the Intergovernmental Organization on Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law in Europe, Equinet, um, or other stakeholders, national authorities, equality bodies, civil society, and end users. Then, yes, please. Um, I, I think it's been a terrific morning, and uh, I've really enjoyed meeting with you all, and um, engaging with these uh, these really difficult issues but i thought um before the session closed it would be good to read to you something that i noted from an interview with sunda pichai um, who you will know is the chief executive officer of google and it's um it's on the ai law hub you'll see it if you go to the google section there they have um, a set of responsible AI practices as principles that they say they apply. I'm not arguing for or against any of this. I'm just, this is information for you, okay? Um, but in um, a, an interview on the 20th of September in Helsinki, um, Sundar Pichai said this, and this is how the FT reported it, the Financial Times, the business newspaper. He said, AI required smart regulation that balanced innovation with protecting citizens. While many regulators are more focused on tackling Google over antitrust than AI at the moment, the company is keen to avoid repeating some of the tech industry's past mistakes by working, quotes, in partnership between government and business. In the interview, Mr. Pichai suggested looking to existing laws to govern how AI is used, quotes, rather than assuming 
that everything you have to do is new. When new regulations are acquired, they should be applied to particular sectors and industries, such as healthcare and energy, he said, rather than through a blanket vetting of algorithms, as some politicians have suggested. Quotes, it is such a broad cross-cutting technology, so it's important to look at regulation more in certain vertical situations, Mr. Pichai said. Quotes, there are areas where we need to do the research before we know what are the right kinds of approaches we need to take, he said, citing as aspects of AI that have caught politicians' attention, including bias, safety, and explainability. Quotes, rather than rushing into it in a way that prevents innovation and research, you actually need to solve some of the difficult problems. I don't know whether I agree with that or not, but I thought it's quite interesting to know that's what he's saying. And there are some commonalities between that and what we've been discussing today. Thank you for sharing that and bringing also an industry perspective in the, uh, in the, in the panel. I think we do need to acknowledge that a few people from the industry have been here and it's been very useful also to get their insights and uh, we'll continue that cooperation with them uh, as well. Uh, in that sense, it's good to mention that also the Council of Europe has a platform of cooperation with uh, the industry and internet intermediaries, which is a good platform because any legislation or standards that are moving forward really need to be multi-stakeholder in its design, uh, so to actually be effective. Good. I see there's no hands raising or questions, so I think it's time to start wrapping it up. I, before I give the floor to Irina for the last uh, words uh, uh, of what's going to happen next steps, I just want to remind you a few logistics. At the end of the room, there is uh, an, a, a table where you can add your name, organization, and email address. If you add your email address, you'll get a little summary or, and all the various information that was shared here, plus links for signing up to newsletters, etc., like that. So you can sign for that. You are not signed up to anything. It's just purely an information email one time. And there's also hopefully still publications from the Human Rights Commission on Human Rights uh, on AI, unboxing AI, and uh, another report from ECRI, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance on uh, Algorithmic Decision Making and Discrimination, which was the opening presentation this morning. Thank you everyone from my side, and I give the floor to Irina, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mena. Thank you, all the speakers, rapporteurs, participants. You have been totally amazing. I would count this as a multi-stakeholder consultation connected to our intergovernmental processes and definitely will bring home the ideas that I can see were converging here from the different groups. Um, for the sake of full disclosure, I will just list them very quickly. The, the ideas that stuck to me as being probably the most consensual ones um, that it's important to build the knowledge base of artificial intelligence and expertise in the oversight bodies, but also in all the law enforcement, judiciary, and all those state institutions that are responsible for ensuring human rights compliance. Build multi-stakeholders groups, just like this, but with the industry, which is probably the next challenge, to manage the issues and processes at the national level, of course, internationally too. Um, the government should create compulsory public registry of algorithms and develop a strategy for monitoring and preventing negative impact on human rights. I think this is what came out of all of your discussions. Uh, it's important to regulate the process more than the outcome. Um, make algorithm, algorithmic impact assessment compulsory and be transparent, not just about the algorithms, but also the ways they are used by the organizations when they make decisions. You know, what is the relationship between the result from the algorithm and the final, perhaps final human decision? Uh, how is this interpreted and what are the internal rules? Consider international standards for cross-border applications. You were saying standards should be sectoral. Well, cross-border use of algorithms or the traveling of algorithms across borders, so when they're made by different organizations from different countries, is probably one area to look into. Um, regulating and finally increase the awareness of the public about potential threats and vulnerabilities. 
and ensure adequate information by organization towards the subjects of algorithms. So this is the agenda that we have mapped here in this four-hour discussion. Again, we'll take it back to the Council of Europe uh, Committee, Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence, to ECRI, to all the other committees that are working sectorally on this topic. And of course, we will use this, um, this input for our next steps in working with Equinet and other partners, equality bodies, to see how they can become more informed, uh, more adequate, more resourced actors in this field. I'd like to, take, to thank all the participants, uh, all the technical staff as well that are doing an amazing job. Um, and here, the colleagues, uh, Mino and Zeynep, um, the rapporteurs, and I wish you a great IGF in the next days. Thank you. Thank you.